Nation of America. Welcome and thank you all for attending tonight's webcast on CCFA Partners, a patient-powered research network. Tonight you will hear how you can take part in IBD research and learn how you can access tools and resources to help you manage your disease. After the presentation, we will open up the program for your questions. So as questions arise, please type them into the question box and we will review as many questions as we can at the end. I now have the pleasure of introducing our speakers for today's program. So first we have Dr. Millie Long, who is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, and she is also a co-investigator for CCFA Partners. Uh, then we have Susan Johnson, who is a member of the Patient Governance Committee for CCFA Partners. Sue has been instrumental in helping to identify and inform the research agenda. She is also on the CCFA Partners Project Selection Committee and has served on CCFA's Grant Review Committee. And then we also have Nick Usel, who is another member of the Patient Governance Committee for CCFA Partners. In his role, he's helped advise on the mission of this research initiative. Nick is also on the CCFA Partners Steering Committee is an active volunteer within CCFA's advocacy efforts and was a past chair of the CCFA National Council of College Leaders Program for the Foundation. We are very excited to have such wonderful speakers here today. So without further ado, I will now turn the program over to Dr. Long. Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining tonight so that we can share a little bit that we've learned in developing the CCFA Partners Patient Powered Research Network. Our objectives for the call tonight are first to tell you some of the vision and the background behind the creation of CCFA Partners and then tell you a little bit about who we are and how it works. We already have some great data on what we have already learned but we certainly have much more to learn with your help in the future. We'll also, led by uh, Sue and Nick, have a demonstration of the, P the CCFA Partners uh, PPRN um, website and a summary of why we think Partners is important uh, in not only in helping further the research agenda uh, for both Crohn's disease and colitis, but potentially also to help individuals uh, with disease management tools. Next slide. We now have a video that we'd like to show you. When you live with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, your life is a study of what's working for your body and what isn't. Constantly trying to connect the dots. Thousands of other citizen scientists like you are also looking for answers and CCFA Partners is helping these patients connect their dots by creating the largest online database of real-world experiences. This initiative, which began in 2011, is now changing what it means to be a patient by allowing you to help shape future research. Your input helps scientists around the world better understand IBD. You'll see how your data compares with other patients, and you'll have daily access to apps, tools, and a secure community of thousands to help you manage your health. By completing a simple survey twice a year, you can be a member and play a critical role in shaping the future of treatments for IBD. Enroll today at ccfapartners.org. So the vision behind the development of this community was to use internet-based recruitment and data collection to create a cohort or a group of IBD patients. As many of you well know, IBD is a relatively rare disease, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and therefore we often need tools like the internet to bring people together from not only all over the United States but all over the world so that we can study various aspects of inflammatory bowel diseases. We can use these data to follow the natural history of disease in this very large, diverse population. We can also uh, allow patients to help through patient-generated data. You can tell us about prior exposures. You can tell us about health behaviors, uh, things like exercise level or sleep or diet, and we can measure outcomes. We can include diverse data sources 
we have the ability to not only include survey data, but also link to things like health applications and devices, things like Fitbit that we'll talk a little bit about. Also, there's the ability to link to personal health records as well. We can create this widely used resource, which can then also uh, be a wonderful uh, support network to support other studies. And so potentially, um, other uh, individual studies could recruit from within CCFA partners. We also, in, in my mind, most importantly, increase patient partners and citizen scientists. We can come back to you as the patient community and find out what's important to you, what we need to study to improve your lives with the goal of improving outcomes. Next slide. The background and timeline behind the development of our patient-powered research network uh, dates back to 2011 when we initially began with an internet-based registry where patient members would fill out surveys on various aspects of their disease. It did include data on sleep and diet, um, medications they've used, and then we followed them forward to use instruments that patients self-reported the activity of their disease. They also self-reported um, various other aspects of living with inflammatory bowel diseases, um, such as their mood, um, such as um, how active they could be, such as how comfortable they felt uh, in various um, you know, interventions and activities. And this helped us to understand how the inflammatory bowel diseases were affecting their lives. In 2013, we, we were able to expand this just registry at that point into a patient-powered research network. We brought in talented individuals uh, such as Sue and Nick, who you'll hear from today, who helped to guide uh, the research agenda and helped us to bring patients into the fold so that we can now study things that are important to you. Over this time, we've also developed some disease tracking tools that we'll show you that we think may help in terms of disease management as well. Now, in 2015, we feel like we're a super network. We know we have a long ways to go, but we have over 14,000 patients enrolled, and we hope to continue to increase enrollment so that not only can we improve outcomes with patients, we can learn a lot in the process. Next slide. And here is who we are and why we call ourselves the CCFA Partners Patient Powered Research Network. These three entities, the IBD Patient Community, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, who has helped fund and support and been instrumental to the development and maintenance of this um, patient-powered network, as well as researchers at the University of North Carolina and now across the country who help with the selection of projects for CCFA partners. Each component of this triangle is very important in um, not only uh, the development, but now the maintenance of this patient-powered research network. Next slide. And here is who our governance are. So we have the research team, which consists of specialists in inflammatory bowel disease. It also has epidemiologists, biostatisticians, data management personnel, programmers, bioinformaticists, a wide, diverse team that helps to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the PPRN and help to write some of the papers and analyze some of the data so that we can feed that data back to you, the patient community. And then we have the Patient Governance Committee. This is a group of five patients. Um, these patients were selected not only for prior participation in CCFA, part, uh, CCFA um, research endeavors, but also through uh, actually an online vote through Chronology, um, a website for patients living with Crohn's disease, to bring uh, individuals in who could help to, to really drive the research agenda and, and govern and make sure that we are doing the best by the patient members. You'll hear more from those patient governance committee members tonight, a really integral component of our, our, our team. We also have an advisory committee, as well as a project selection committee, so that researchers who want to use data from within the CCFA partners PPRM apply and provide a justification and a rationale and why this question would be important and worth the time of uh, patients uh, involved in the community. And that project selection committee includes patients and researchers from across the country who help to judge which projects should be moved forward within CCFA partners. And then at the CCFA, we have an oversight committee that helps to govern all of these various components and make sure that the PPRN is moving forward in the right way. Next slide. 
In terms of how it works, um, the, the main component of the CCFA Partners PPRN is actually a survey. It's a survey that you can complete in the comfort of your home, um, any computer uh, access through the web. And this survey is in a modular design where there's a baseline aspect to it that includes information like what kind of inflammatory bowel disease you have, what medications you're taking, if you've had prior surgeries, those type of basic information. And then there are various module, modules that can be added to that. For example, we've used modules uh, that val have validated exercise. And so it's a, a very short survey instrument that tells us how much activity you get on a, on a regular basis. Or a module that um, has validated and been compared to prescription records so that we can tell about adherence to medication. Or questions surrounding quality of life, um, prevention activities, things like if you've been on a, a steroid, have you had a, a bone mineral density test? Or have you had appropriate vaccinations if you're on medications that suppress your immune system? And also, we look at something called patient reported outcomes. These are, these are measures of everything from pain to sleep to mood, because we want to understand more about living with inflammatory bowel disease and how not only medications, but other aspects affect that. Next slide. So one of the important aspects of the TPRN now that we have uh, beyond, expanded beyond a registry is that the questions that we try to answer within the cohort are really proposed by the patient. And so this allows not only the questions to be proposed but discussed in this forum. Other patients can vote on which questions are most important. And then based on that information, the research team can put out a request to researchers to study that very aspect that's important to patients. So let me give you some examples of questions that have been proposed by patients. And so one example, we should compare individuals who manage their disease with medication and those who manage their disease with popular diets in the IBD community such as the STD diet, the FODMAP diet, paleo diet. Other examples may include a gluten-free diet. Another example of a question that was proposed was to research the validity of VSL number three probiotic in controlling a flare or as a factor in remission. Another question was, what is the role of stress and the stress response in autoimmunity? And finally, another example is a patient asked to compare the symptoms of IBD patients who consume dairy and those who avoid dairy to see if there is a preferential diet. Next slide. And so what happens with each of these questions is that they're voted on. And once we see the votes, we see what is most important to patients. And then a member of the research team then posts a response. That response may include a link to other information about that very topic. And we also categorize each of these questions. So for example, a question that's top priority means we think it's really important and we agree and this is something that we should try to look at within the CCFA Partners PPRN. If we already have data collected on this topic, we could potentially analyze it and get a response back to the community. If we haven't yet collected data on this, we would put a request out to researchers to propose a study to look at this. And so for example, um, in regards to the question about um, diet and dairy, uh, this was a response that as dairy products can exacerbate GI symptoms in many individuals, we did look at this to a lesser extent in a prior study in CCFA partners. In this study, we looked at dietary patterns and symptoms of IBT, and we found that some foods like yogurt, rice, and bananas were, were more frequently reported to improve symptoms, whereas non-leafy vegetables, spicy foods, fruit, nuts, um, fried foods, milk, red meat, those type of aspects those type of foods were actually more frequently um, reported to worsen symptoms. However, we feel that this hasn't fully answered the question. And so we really feel that it's, uh, we need more data to even better understand dietary recommendations. And in research, the best way to understand a, an intervention is something called a randomized controlled trial, where some people are uh, basically randomized to eat certain components like milk, and other people are, are randomized to not eat that, and then we compare the outcomes. And so potentially, that's something that could be done within CCFA partners to help us understand the role of milk consumption in exacerbation of disease. And so we've labeled this question as a top priority, and then I've also given you a reference as to the other work that we've done previously on dietary patterns and self-reported associations of diet and symptoms. Next slide. 
The other way uh, this PPRN is, I think, really neat is that you can actually connect other data sources and other devices like health tracking devices and apps to the PPRN in a confidential format. And therefore, you can upload data on what your activity level is potentially through a Fitbit or how you're sleeping through a Fitbit. Um, again, map my fitness, more activity levels. But these components can allow you to track this aspect of your disease, such as exercise, and then compare it to other aspects that you're reporting, like your disease activity. This is an important means for us to better understand some of these, um, these, these aspects of disease management that have not been able to be studied as of yet. Next slide. The data also come as a two-way street. In other words, certainly you input the data for um, research purposes to help us to answer questions that are important to you, but we also report that data back to you. And the more data you contribute, contribute, the more you learn. And we can compare your data in an anonymous fashion to other people in the cohort. Or we can allow you to track over time something like the short Crohn's disease activity index, which is a self-report index of several questions that get at bowel movement frequency and pain and other factors to help you to see how you're doing over time in relation to other aspects of your disease management. This other dashboard aspect, Health Today, is just measuring how you would rate your overall health in a day-to-day -day process. But again, a tracking tool that can be helpful to you. And also, we may be able to see patterns associated with other aspects of uh, disease management. Next slide. What have we learned so far? We think a lot. We think we have a lot more to learn. But I certainly want to share some of the um, interesting results we've found so far. We've, we've now published over 25 scientific abstracts and 10 full manuscripts with multiple others that have been are in various stages of preparation. The actual abstracts and manuscripts are posted on our website, so you can review those. Additionally, we've made lay summaries that are just paragraph summaries um, using simple language of what we learned and why it was important so that everyone can understand the major take-home points. Next slide. Some other ex examples of what we've learned. Uh, we asked people about prevention activities. Bone health, uh, very important, particularly in people who've been on prior corticosteroids, as that can increase your risk for weakened bones or osteopenia. And about half of patients with prior steroid use have had a bone density scan or take calcium and vitamin D to help with bone strength. While that's a good percentage, we certainly would like it to be more um, to try to improve bone health in our population. Skin care. About 40% of patients who are on medications that suppress the immune system reported having ever had a, a skin exam. And very few, only 16%, reported always wearing sunscreen to prevent skin cancer. This is actually very important because in the last several years, we've learned a great deal about some of the medications we use in the treatment of both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Most importantly, one called azathioprine, Imuran, um, or cousin 6MP, seems to increase the photosensitivity to ultraviolet A light. So in essence, it makes you more susceptible to a, a sunburn, and those sunburns make you more susceptible to developing skin cancer. So we found that patients on that medication in particular, as well as some other classes of medications, have an increased risk of skin cancer over time. So all the better that we actually try to prevent that before it happens, have people wear sunscreen, get skin checks by dermatologists to find things early before they become a problem. And yet, as you can see by these numbers, that really is not happening in the majority of patients. And so it's something that we can promote and educate within this PPRN. Vaccination is another example of prevention where only about two-thirds of patients um, had had the flu vaccine in the prior year. One of the things we do know is that the inactivated flu vaccine is safe regardless of the medications you're on and, in fact, helps pre to prevent complications in patients with inflammatory bowel diseases. So we hope to get that vaccination rate up even higher. Next slide. Another example, we used a measure of medication adherence. Um, and unfortunately, a good percentage of the population had a relatively low score on these medication adherence questions. And when we looked, the pa generally patients actually felt better and had less symptoms when they actually had high medication adherence scores. So again, another opportunity to try to help to improve the health of our population through improving adherence. Next slide. 
Another example, diet. I actually mentioned um, this study earlier when I was talking about one of the patient proposed research questions. We looked at various dietary patterns to see uh, if there were any that were associated consistently with improving or worsening symptoms. And what we found that fruits and non-leafy vegetables were the most likely to worsen symptoms. And uh, ironically, um, some of these same, um, same things were also likely to make symptoms better in some individuals. But reported symptoms may be from food intolerances rather than inflammation from IBD. And as I mentioned on the prior slide, uh, many things like um, banana and grains, other things um, actually consistently seem to improve some symptoms. And so these patterns are all posted on our website that we learned from this study and available in the lay summary if that's something of interest to you. But certainly, as proposed by the patient who wanted us to further study diet, I feel this is a really important topic that we need to learn more about. And this particular uh, PPRN can help us. Next slide. What about sleep? So we actually used an instrument that measured kind of self-reported um, sleep quality. And we found that in a group of patients who based on um, symptom scores were in remission at baseline, when we looked at their sleep during that time period, if their sleep was reduced, if they didn't get enough, six months later, they had an increased risk of flare. That was controlling for everything else, controlling for their medications, controlling for other aspects of their disease. So we really do feel that sleep is independently associated and potentially protective, and that's something we may be able to help and modify. We also looked at depression. We looked at depression in elderly patients, and we found that it was much more common in elderly patients than in the general IBD population, and that depression was associated with increased disease activity and reduced medication adherence. So again, an opportunity to potentially allow us to intervene and educate to try to help to improve this aspect of disease. Next slide. Exercise. So instead of using a Fitbit, we didn't have that technology yet, we used a validated scale where patients self-reported how much activity they were doing each day and for how long, how intense it was. And we found that in a similar um, vein to our study of sleep, when we looked at patients who were in remission based on symptom scores, those who had less exercise, even though they were feeling well, actually had an increased risk of flare of Crohn's disease in the following six months. So again, there may be a component of exercise in terms of maintaining overall uh, well-being. Next slide. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues on the Patient Governance Committee. Thank you, Dr. Long. Now we're going to go over to the CCFA Partners website and take a look at how, how it actually works. So as was mentioned before, um, let me back up a little bit. My name is Sue Johnson. I've been a patient with Crohn's disease since 1991. So tools like this are really exciting to me because I've seen the, the progress that's been made over the years in the study of Crohn's disease and the development of new therapies and, and progress towards finding the cause and the cure for this. So this is a, a really exciting development that patients like us can actually participate in. So when you get to CCFA Partners and register for CCFA Partners, you'll be asked to fill out a questionnaire, as Dr. Long mentioned before. And this will ask you um, your exercise habits, your sleep habits, uh, your questions about your diet, things like that, your medications. So twice a year, you will be asked to complete a survey. And what this does will update the database, because remember, the, the data that you input here is going to be helpful to researchers that are looking at the various questions. So not only is it helping researchers, but if you would like to track your health and, and see how you're feeling and compare your health from where you were six months ago, this is an ideal tool to do this. So the health data that you input will give you a summary of what you have input into your survey. And then you can also do health tracking by um, different time periods. So and you can select different factors of what you want to look at. So this is just one way of being able to track your disease activity and how it progresses from day to day. You may 
see that there's certain events in your life that maybe you're a little more stressful and you can see that your disease activity has changed because of that. So this is, this is one way that you can track your own health activity. So then we can go over to My Health Measures. And this is from where you entered into the questionnaire and where you stood at that time. So this gives you a comparison of what the median is and where your score is at. So this is a, a demo ID, so these are not necessarily my scores, but this will just give you an idea of where you stand as far as the median goes. If your scores are a little bit lower than average, a little bit higher than average, and just give you an idea of, of where you stand on that. And these were all the things that Dr. Wong mentioned on there too. And here's another way of looking at it is my dashboard. And you saw a snapshot of this as well. And this will just give you another look into where you stand as compared to others um, as far as your scores go. And then we have my connections. So and this is where whatever app or device you may be using that you would like to connect to your data on CCFA partners, you can connect from here. So as you can see, we've got a good variety of, of apps and devices that you can connect to. So this is a real exciting aspect of it and I think one that can add a little bit of fun to it because you can track your activity against your disease activity and see what influences another thing. So as we mentioned too before is that this is also an opportunity to be able to participate in presenting research questions and being involved in, in what actually gets looked at. So here is where you see the most um, voted on research questions right now. And, and this website is, is going under a little bit of a redesign, so, so some of the things you might see might be named a little bit differently in the future. But as you can see, here are some of the top questions that have been asked recently. Um, some of these questions were in the slide as well. And here's where you get to cast your vote, whether you feel that this is an important research question that you would like to see a little more attention be made to it. Then we have active studies, and these are studies that are actually in the works that you can see what's going on in, in the researchers that are looking at this, who's participating. And one of the things when you sign up for partners too is that at some point you may be contacted based on your responses to your questionnaires to see if you have an interest in participating in, in different studies. So for example, um, there's also two other members of my family who suffer from Crohn's disease. So if there's a question or a study that's being done on uh, family history or family connections, I may be contacted to see if I would like to participate in a study about the, some genetic components of this. So that's what's really kind of neat about this too, is that it gives you an opportunity to potentially participate in some studies. So then we go to, oh, we can look at completed research. And these are studies that have already been done. And as Dr. Wong mentioned, here you'll see the, the summaries and the abstracts that have been completed on these studies. So you can see what's already been worked on. And then my contributions, this is where this tracks how many surveys that you've completed. So if you don't remember that you completed a survey in the last six months, here's a, here's a log of how many surveys you've completed and when you've completed them. The members page will give you an idea of how many members we have, how many have completed social profiles, and you can see where where people are across the United States and even across the world and, and where a lot of these patients are located that are participating in partners. So this is always kind of interesting to see where everybody's coming from. And then, then there's blog posts. And you can see that 
different people have contributed to this. We have researchers. Um, we also have people from the Patient Governance Committee contribute here. So it's, it's a great page to see kind of what's been happening and what other people are talking about. So one of the things when you participate in the um, in the research studies is that you can see like what level you're at. So you can look at well how many how many surveys have I responded to? Am I completing enough? There's a, a feature where you can check in on a daily basis where you just update a few questions that is about how you're feeling today, if you're having any abdominal pain, and a couple other simple questions. And this tracks just how many you've completed. Research proposer um, tells you what level you're at, whether you've submitted any research questions, whether you've voted on some, whether you've actually discussed any, and then the community space. And this is where if you've created a, a social profile. So this is the basic overview of the partners website. I encourage everyone to to check it out, go out there and certainly register for it and take the surveys because this is this is the heart of, of CCFA partners in helping to create the data that are going to help the researchers. Can we go back to the slides please? So just to summarize that, that again, we encourage everyone to, to enroll in CCFA partners. The data that you enter in there is going to be completely confidential. So all you need to do is put in an email address, but your data will never be shared with anyone. Your um, privacy is protected there. Your name, address, um, anything about that is going to be completely secure. And this, this will help to create the database so that we have the largest US study on the impact of IBD. And this is going to help all the research that the scientists are using because this is actually reported from the patient. And again, I, as I said, you may be contacted for possible participation in other studies. And the impact that this has to all patients is tremendous because this is going to help help advance the knowledge of what is actually causing IBD and what therapies can be created to um, help prevent IBD. And it's just, it's a win-win for everyone here. So I encourage everyone to, to participate in the partners. So now I would like to turn this over to Nick. Thanks, Sue. And, and as, as um, we heard from Dr. Long and, and Sue, uh, I'm one of the other members of the Patient Governance Committee, and I'm here to talk to you about why this is important for patients and why it's important to, uh, to belong to CCFA partners. And I think Dr. Long and Sue did a great job showing you some of the functionality of the site and, and uh, some of the promises it has for, you know, uh, for patient use and, and also to really further the research agenda. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So here's a couple of points about why it's important to, uh, for patients to participate in this. Um, as we heard from Dr. Long, we're already getting really important um, outcomes and, and learning a lot of really important things about IBD from uh, the data that we collect via CCFA partners. Um, as Dr. Long mentioned, you know, we were seeing you know, correlations between sleep and, and why that's important. Um, and we're also learning about uh, uh, prevention activities and, and good opportunities for patients to learn um, what's working for other people and have those conversations with your doctors. Um, so, and it raises sort of the, uh, the awareness of uh, medication adherence and, and those ch particular challenges that medication adherence poses for patients. Um, and really gives you patients a good idea of, of ways in which they can you know, see what's happening with other patients and, and really compare their data to uh, what's happening generally in the community and, and see where you might be able to um, get a better grasp and understanding of your diseases and, and how it works. And, and that includes diet and exercise, as, as we heard. So really, we are gathering really important information. And, and as more people join and, and submit data, we are getting, we're having a more, we'll have a more robust um, group of data that we can pull from and, and really dive deep into and learn from. 
Uh, and so it's and, and it's important to note that this isn't only uh, you know a benefit to the researchers. It's a uh, it's symbiotic. It's beneficial to the patients as well. Um, patients uh, can have really great educational opportunities. You can learn a lot from participation on the uh, on the website and seeing what other patients, what kind of questions people are asking, things you may not have thought about before, and and you can see the actual results of the data that's been submitted onto the website, and and that's really powerful from a patient perspective. You can actually see where your data is going and and uh, it, who's using it, and ultimately what it, it um, what the outcome is of the of the research that's being done on the data. Um, Sue did a great job in mentioning that patients can also have access to participate in external studies. Um, a lot of researchers around the world are coming to CCFA partners because we have such a, a rich data set, and they're looking at at the data. And if they if they want to look at some particular subset of patients, um, and you and you meet the the certain profile of what they're looking for, they might be contacting you to participate in a study that is not only going to further the general. Um, uh, education and, and uh, understanding of what uh, of how, how IBD works, but it also could Im, you know personally impact you as a, as a participant in the study and, and improve your life. Um, I think the the two points that I'm uh, that I'm going to mention next are the most exciting for me as a as a patient. Um, the ability to pose research questions. I think this has never really been done before, where patients can have a stake in setting the research agenda uh, and we as the Patient Governance Committee have been with CCFA partners as we have gone through this process since the beginning, really helping direct uh, what we think is important. And and now we're in a position where all where patients around the world can help pose research questions. Maybe some patients thinking about something that nobody else has thought about, and that's a really important thing that uh, we just haven't looked at yet. And so patients can pose that question, and we can all collectively vote it. And it makes research a much more democratic process, and that's really exciting for me as a patient. Um, I mentioned that it's uh, that it is symbiotic; that patients and researchers both benefit from this new CCFA partners, um, and patients benefit uh, in a major way by being able to access disease management tools um, through all those uh, uh, applications that Sue shows you on the website, where you can link your data from your uh, Fitbit or, or other health tracking tools. And you will, and you can get a look at your survey data and see how your disease is behaving over time, and that can include you into to certain things, um, whether that's uh, whether that's your uh, sleep uh, activity, how much sleep you get has an impact on your disease, uh, whether that's your stress level. Um, you can look at all these sort of lifestyle factors and and be able to to see how your disease is progressing um, over time, which is really powerful and um, gives you a lot of information in which you can uh, then use to hopefully avoid a flare or or something like that. And and as I mentioned, you're, you have the ability to view it and compare your data with the research findings and see where you're falling in on the continuum. You can see where your social scores are, for example, um, and, and you can look at all that information. And the knowledge is really powerful um, in, this, uh, in this paradigm with CCFA partners. Uh, next slide, please. So how can you how can you help? How can we make the data set even more robust than it is and grow and, and get more than 14,100 patients that we currently have? It's really important not only to sign up for yourself if you're not currently part of CCFA partners, but also spread the word. Um, this is sort of we're in the new age of, of patient powered research, and this is sort of the, the 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 breaking frontier, I would say, on on um, research and. By spreading the word, we can really improve the lives of, of all people who suffer from IBD. Um, and it's not only important to sign up uh, and, and fill out the baseline survey, but also to keep coming back to the website and keep filling out the, the surveys every six months and continuing to input data because we don't want just somebody to come once and never come again. It's important to continue to come and, and always uh, and always submit the data so we can uh, be able to track people over time. Uh, and you can see how you are, how your disease is behaving over time. Uh, and we really want the input um, uh, from from the patients out there. Um, there are, we really want to know whether there's particular aspects about living with IBD that you think are important that should that should be studied. Um, 
like I said, maybe there's there's any, there's any number of, of questions that, that people might have, and this is a great opportunity for people to propose them and, and see if other people are, are also interested in the same thing. And, um, so the, 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 last, uh, the last point I'll make before I turn it back over to Angela is that it's great to be part of this community where you can interact with other patients on on the website and see where um, and see the updates on the blog and and I think it's it, it, it's great there's great promise in CCFA partners and um, it's just now to the point where we have to spread the word and, and make sure that people are coming in and, and submitting data um, so this concludes my portion of the presentation I'd like to hand it back over to Angela Thank you to all our speakers for that informative presentation. It was really, really interesting, and I appreciate it. Um, so now it's time for the question and answers part of our program. Today's questions will be taken from the web participants. Um, in the interest of time, I will also ask to keep your questions related to the topic of CCFA partners. Um, we've got a bunch of good questions coming in. Um, so for our first question, I'm going to um, ask Susan. Um, got a lot of questions about data privacy. So how secure is the CCFA partner's data? The data privacy is, is a critical aspect of um, what we talked about when we created this site. So we went to great lengths to make sure that we are following all the government standards as far as data privacy goes. So the, any personal identifiers that you have, such as name and address, will not be used in research. It will be maintained securely. We will never release that contact information without a patient's permission. And the data that we collect, too, will never be used um, will never be released to any third parties for any marketing. Um, some people have concerns that we might release some of this information to pharmaceutical companies, but, but we protect that data and we will never be releasing it to any third parties and certainly not, uh, and only with someone's permission would we release that data. Great, thanks. Um, so Nick, we have another we have another bunch of questions regarding how frequently you can actually enter in data and what's the suggested amount of times that patients actually log into the CCFA partners website um, and if there's ways of entering in your data other than the baseline survey and the six month uh, survey. Uh, sure, that's a that's a really good question, and and I think you can sign on to the website every single day, and there's always a there's there's a couple of different features on the website where you can um, answer questions about how you're feeling that day, for example, and you can update how much you slept the night before, uh, what your diet uh, was like. Um, so I you can really sign on every day, and and in terms of the best time to sign on, I think that's really whatever time you are going to remember to do it um, is the best time. Whether that, if that's first thing in the morning, um, last thing you do before you go to bed, I think what it's just falling into a sort of routine. And, and there are a lot of opportunities to, to engage with the website. And, and you can sign on every day and, and submit data, uh, which would, it would be very powerful. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, Millie, there's a question here about distinguishing between CCFA partners, kids and teens, and the CCFA partners patient powered re research network. And how how it can kids and teens participate in the patient powered research network? Can a, a parent um, sign up for their um, kid? How, how does that how does that work? That's a great question. And so the initial CCFA partners was launched as an adult cohort. People aged 18 is over. And actually, soon after that launch, we developed the CCFA partners kids and teens cohort. And what this includes is any child under the age of 18 living with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. But as you can imagine, some of those children, particularly young children, wouldn't be able to do surveys on their own. Certainly any child would need the permission of their parent to be able to include their data in that cohort. And so what CCFA Partners Kids and Teens is, is it's a joint program where both the parent and the child consent. And there are parts of the data that the parent fills in, and there are parts of the data that the child fills in if they're of an age where they could do that. And we follow these kids over time. 
Now, the, the kids and teens is not yet officially part of the um, PPRN, but we have made the CCFA partners kids and teens cohort have much of the same adaptability, the same reporting functions, all of those same aspects um, can be used for the children as well. And certainly any of the questions proposed in the PPRN, data that would be asked about, you know, specific to childhood onset inflammatory bowel disease, those questions could still be answered within the kids and teens cohort. So they're, they're intimately linked. And the um, kids and teens will have access to many of these same tools and features that we think are very important um, for adult patients uh, who are participating in the PPRN. Great, thanks. Um, so Sue, there's some other questions about uh, like how do you share, who do you share this information with? Like when you go to your uh, physician or provider, um, do you do you share any of this tracking information with them? Um, The, the information can be shared with really whoever you want to share this with. So it would actually be a great tool to share with your physician so that you can see trends in your disease activity and, mention, and bring that to your physician's attention so that you know, it could potentially lead to possible change in medication, um, maybe changes in your diet or your sleep, but just so that your physician also has a picture of your your overall health and your overall activity, so that they can they can help concentrate on that. So so certainly we encourage that if people feel comfortable in sharing this with their physician, that they do so. Great, thanks, um, Millie. There's a question about a potential uh, research study or inquiry as whether or not this has been conducted yet, and it's in regards to disease activity and quality of life, life satisfaction between participants um, that have, or patients that have IBD and patients who are more isolated, and if there's um, any differences in quality of life. So, uh, so absolutely, there, there is a study underway right now um, that um, an outside researcher is doing that is, is they applied through the project selection committee and felt that social support um, would be very important in not only kind of maintaining remission, but potentially um, in really improving quality of life. And so they um, had an instrument that had been validating, meaning it had been tested in other populations and found to represent aspects of social support. And this survey was released um, within CCFA partners. And then we're measuring some of those other factors because I agree, that is a wonderful question. And the, um, actually the question was originally proposed by a patient researcher. And so it's a citizen scientist that, that brought that forward. And I uh, believe it is still ongoing. I don't think we've recruited quite enough individuals with that social support survey. And so in that setting, if you do join CCFA partners and you're asked to do an optional module on social support, then certainly we want your participation and we want uh, your input on that. Any of these questions that you think of, please put on the portal and so that we can get votes, so we can respond. And certainly, if you want to be involved in the process at all as well, all of the citizen scientists, those that propose these questions, can be as involved as they want to be in not only the development, potentially, of a survey, but the interpretation of the results, and even publishing the paper. We want to include these citizen scientists on the publications as well if they have interest in that. And so please take a look at those questions, put these ideas out there, and then we'll summarize what has been done um, thus far. And if, you know, if nothing, or if we think it's a good idea of partners, we can work with you to find the right researcher to bring this idea to life. Great, thanks. So Nick, there's some questions about, so say uh, CCFA Partners research, research Study gets published. Am I going to find out that my data was used in that study? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's a, a great question. And, and as a, a research network, we're really committed to uh, increasing transparency regarding research participation. And, and to that point, we've uh, developed an access log, if you will, um, under the My Contribution section that Stu showed you on the, the portal. Um, and this enables patients to see the name and the institution of the investigator who's, a, who, who's accessing their data. Um, they can see it to the detail of the date of the access, 
uh, so you can see when your when your data has been um, received and, and is being looked at. Um, and then you can also see the title and the description of the specific study that's being undertaken and why your data is being looked at. Um, once the studies are complete, as as we saw from Dr. Long, um, we're, we have provided a link to uh, the summary of the findings uh, and along with the abstract uh, from the study. Um, and so, the, so that's a uh, that's so you can absolutely see who is accessing your data and at what time and ultimately for what purpose, which is which is all part of our goal towards being as transparent as possible. Great, thanks, um, Millie. Another question, um, more related to the research. So, how does a research study distinguish between symptoms related to IBD versus other diagnoses, such as sleep problems and decreased energy that not may not be IBD related? So that's very true. Um, many things can contribute to fatigue and poor sleep. We do ask about other factors. Um, so, for example. Um, we ask about medical comorbidities. If someone has had, you know, potentially a surgery for a fracture of a bone or something like that, clearly they're not going to be participating in exercise, and they're, that, that is the reason why, and they may have pain related to that and other factors that are influencing their, res their responses to these questions. So we do try to get enough additional information so we also understand what's going on outside of IBD. And in the uh, actually analysis phase, we can do something called control for that, which basically means we can just account for that and try to take that factor out of the analysis so that we can then see some of the more direct relationships between our factors of interest and our outcomes. Great. And it looks like we might have time for about one or two more questions. So, Sue, I'm going to ask you a question regarding integrating with other apps that currently aren't a part of CCFA partners. Do you know if there's any plan on adding GI Buddy as an app within the My Connections page? Yes, uh, GI Buddy is definitely on the radar and we expect that in the not too distant future we will be integrating GI Buddy data with partners, um, especially because there's uh, increased interest in understanding more about diet and its relation with IBD. So uh, GI Buddy is definitely one of the next steps that will be integrated in with partners. Awesome to hear. Okay, well, I'm going to have to say thank you to all of our speakers for answering today's questions. Um, if any of the participants on the call today have any additional questions about CCFA partners, please send us an email at info at ccfapartners.org, um, as shown at the below at the bottom of the screen. So the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America is also available to offer education and support. The IBD Help Center is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time by phone at 888-694-8872, by email at info at ccfa.org, or you can chat online with an information specialist directly at via Answer Chat. Um, and to see more information about Answer Chat, you can just visit ccfa.org for in addition, if you would like to watch any of our other educational webcasts on IBD, please visit the websites on the screen to explore other Crohn's and colitis related topics. You can also connect with other IBD patients and engage in discussion through CCFA community website, support groups, and Power of Two peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentor programs. Um, another uh, great resource is GI Buddy, which someone just asked a question about. And it's a tracking tool and mobile app that has everything you need to stay on top of of managing your IBD. And you can again visit www.ccfa.org for more information. Um, finally, uh, to participate in other education events, you can um, do this by connecting through your local chapter um, and also visit the CCFA website for more information. Let's talk about some other ways to get involved. Um, our Take Steps Walk offer a wonderful way for family and friends and the community to raise um, mission-critical funds. 
So our walk events are filled with live music, food, uh, entertainment, and educational materials. And you can again learn more through visiting CCF www.cctakesteps.org. Um, we also have a team challenge event with um, half marathons and triathlon training programs, and you'll train for a rewarding and exciting endurance event at one of our great destination races. Uh, to join the event, you can visit www.ccteamchallenge.org. And now that our um, presentation is concluding, is a really great opportunity to sign up for CCFA partners. In the chat box, more or less probably located at your bottom right hand side of the screen, um, there will be, appear the link to CCFA partners, which you can click on to become a member today. So on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, I want to thank you for joining us today, and goodbye and good night.